from a miniature. It was taken uh, from a miniature, uh, which um, was in the hands of Miss Phyll Phyllis Rawlins, who was descended from uh, the Champion family. Um, she, I believe, died in about 1990. And when I started researching this, um, there'd been a catalogue in 1974 of Bristol Porcelain, which had had this picture in the front. But it seems that Phyllis uh, was in Scotland and uh, she died. And I don't, don't know whether the miniature ever was ever found. I think, it, I think it's lost now. I don't think it's in the family anymore. And that's Richard and his wife, who is called Judith. Um, and uh, this is a family tree. There, there won't be a test on this afterwards, so you don't, you don't need to worry too much. But you can see Richard there in yellow. And, and there are just a, two or three things I wanted to say about it. The one is that you can see that there's a total of nine children there uh, that Judith and uh, Richard had. And um, unfortunately, two of them died young. Joseph, we know almost nothing about, and there's no trace of his death, but I think uh, he must have died young. And Eliza, who was 13 or 14 when she died um, in Bristol. Uh, but there were still seven children left when uh, Richard Champion uh, was at the, what might be called the peak of his career. Uh, it was a career that went very much up and very much down, so I will be talking about that later on. But a very big family, uh, and Richard was a Quaker. And I'm going to talk about two or three members of the family, just to, by way of a little bit of background. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about Joseph and Nehemiah and his son, uh, William, who was called William Spelter Champion. Um, and so let's just look at those people. So, so Richard's father um, was actually a member of a prominent Bristol Quaker family. The, the Champions were a prominent family. Um, Joseph had actually worked uh, as a merchant in London and Richard's mother died very young so he actually went to London with his father for most of his education and some training as a merchant. Um, but Joseph, his father, uh, at some point, there was a problem. And I, I've never been able, despite lots of research, to find out what that problem was. But he, he basically became cut off from the family uh, in the early 1770s. And he's believed to have lived all over the place, although part of this is not proven either, but Bristol, Bath, London, Antwerp, America. So Joseph really got around a lot, which bearing in mind that Richard Champion's mother was dead must have meant that uh, he had a somewhat disrupted uh, childhood. But he had an uncle also called Richard, uh, in, a, in, in actual fact referred to as Richard Gospel Champion because he was a, a Quaker uh, speaker of some repute and he went all around the Quaker churches um, talking. Now, he was a partner in the Bristol Brass and Wire Company with his uncle Nehemiah, who I mentioned. And he was also um, in partnership in the Goldney Smith uh, Banking Company in Bristol. And Richard's main occupation was as a merchant trading with the West Indies and the Americas. So in 1962, or 1762, I beg your pardon, when Richard was just 19, he was taken into business uh, with, with Richard, his uncle, which is where he learned the trade of, of being a Bristol merchant. Um, I couldn't though finish my brief summary of some of the family without talking about William, because William was a, a little bit of a, a rogue by the look of it. Uh, William um, was very clever. He, he pioneered the manufacture of zinc, was the first person in Europe to manufacture zinc. And uh, his, his father, Nehemiah, um, took over running the brass uh, factory uh, at Baptist Mills and took it over from Abram Darby, the, the well-known Abram Darby. And, and that's the company that became the Bristol Brass Wire Company. Um, but he got fired in 1746 uh, for slightly mysterious reasons. And uh, so he then set up another company in Warmley and he then patented his zinc production process to try and shut everyone out. Um, and uh, 
Unfortunately, though, that, that, that lasted less than 20 years and uh, the factory was in trouble. Uh, in 1765, he was actually caught trying to take his money out of the company without permission. And uh, so he, he left them as well and was dismissed again. And the company was eventually sold back to the Bristol Wire Company. Um, and uh, so it went full circle. And I don't know whether this uh, roguish uh, cousin once removed had any impact on, on Richard, but uh, Richard himself, uh, as you will find out later on, had some ups and downs in his life. And uh, it may be that uh, there was a little influence there that um, basically had some effect on this. So Richard himself was born in Castle Green, which is where the family home was. And it was to be actually the place where the factory was set up to make porcelain. Um, as I've already mentioned, his mother died very young. So he was with his father uh, for most of his early life uh, until he came back to join his uncle in this uh, trade, merchanting with America. And it was almost immediately that he went into this trade that Richard started to make some very influential contacts. And he was very good at making influential contacts and he, he worked quite hard to make influential contacts. Um, but in 1764, a couple of years after he joined, he, he actually eloped uh, to get married. Um, Judith, who, who actually, because her mother was also called Judith, is, is referred to mainly as Julia in the family. Uh, so J Julia Lloyd um, was not a Quaker and uh, Richard uh, eloped uh, to Gretna Green with Julia and got married. And uh, this uh, note below is from the Quaker meeting uh, where it says that uh, various uh, members of the Quaker meeting were sent to uh, meet Richard and meet his wife and to speak to them about uh, how they had uh, disrupted and left the um, Quakers. Richard himself felt he still was a member of the Quakers and actually no further action was taken. So he did remain a member of the Quakers, despite this uh, early problem that he had uh, with them. And of course, the, the Quaker religion was one that uh, had some conflicts with the idea of businessmen. Uh, and so because he was to be a businessman, I think he always sat slightly unhappily within the Quaker family. But one Quaker that he did come to know, I'm not sure how, but uh, in that same period, 1764 five, he first met a man called William Cookworthy, who really was an exceedingly uh, clever man. Uh, I refer to him as a polymath and that I think is fair enough. Um, and he actually met him um, in Devon, uh, in fact, uh, Cookworthy was to set up a porcelain factory in Plymouth because uh, on the land of Baron Camelford, he found uh, powdered China clay and China stone. Well, he found China clay and China stone, which are the two constituents which made Chinese porcelain. And Chinese porcelain is referred to as a hard paste. It, it's actually, it, it, physically, it is hard and you can drop it into boiling water and it won't crack. And most of the porcelain that England had seen up to about the 1740s had all been Chinese because it was imported by the East India Company. And then after the 1740s, people in England started to try and make porcelain themselves. And by and large, they used something called soft paste, which was a, a mixture of various different ingredients, which, uh, could be put in a kiln at a slightly lower temperature, but often they didn't quite have that resilience against uh, hot water and all these things. So for someone in England to make this hard paste in the style of Chinese porcelain was unique uh, at that point. Um, Cookworthy was the first and only person uh, to have made this porcelain made of hard paste. And he was an important person uh, for Richard to have met. Um, in 1766, uh, his uncle Richard uh, died and he inherited shares in the brass works. And he also succeeded his uncle as a voluntary treasurer of the Bristol Royal Infirmary. 
where a whole string of the family, uh, the, the champion family, were treasurers. And he was actually a very successful um, treasurer. He was only 23 when he came into the role. Um, but I think he was uh, responsible for a good degree of fundraising and various other things. So that uh, he, he actually was quite successful. But with the money, I think, that he inherited from his uncle, uh, he decided now that he'd got some experience to set up as a shipper to America and the Caribbean in his own right. And he set up, first of all, in partnership with a partner called Edward Bryce, but very quickly um, that was actually terminated and he went off uh, on his own. And um, he joined the Society of Merchant Venturers in Bristol. Uh, he, he later became a, a senior warden and then a member of the committee. And on the left is a couple of uh, records of his shipping activity. The one at the top <coughs> is, um, <coughs> excuse me, the one at the top is, is a, an illustrated ship's log uh, by Nicholas Pocock. Uh, Nicholas Pocock was a ship's captain. And as you see just below, it refers to the Aurora where his brother Isaac Pocock was also a ship's captain. And both of the Pococks um, actually uh, took ships which uh, were at least partially in Richard's, Richard Champion's ownership. And um, in the case of Nicholas Pocock, he, he eventually gave up being a ship's captain and became a marine artist. And you can perhaps see why from what you see there, that he, he had these one of wonderful illustrated logs of his journeys. And down below, that you can see that Richard, although he was interested in uh, porcelain uh, and, and was setting up a business in porcelain, his merchanting business could not have been more diverse. Um, there you see lime and wrought iron and uh, casks and kegs of nails and vinegar and cheese and paint and linseed oil and sugar and gunpowder. Almost anything you can imagine he was buying from local tradesmen and exporting them uh, to various points uh, in the West. And those records, uh, the one at the bottom, is from the Bristol ship presentments, which are a wonderful record of what went through the port. And they're available at the Central Library, where I spent lots of happy hours finding all the ones that involved Champion. And he also was in a partnership uh, to export refined sugar. And this is because he had formed a partnership in America to import unrefined sugar. So he was bringing sugar back from America um, where it, obviously it was produced on plantations, plantations where slaves were in employment. Uh, and he was refining it with a partner, Booth Champion, and sending it back out uh, to America and to other places. So he was very active uh, as a merchant. And one of the very first uh, influential contacts that he made was in South Carolina, uh, and that was Henry, Henry Lawrence. And he, he was a plantation owner who rose to great uh, prominence in South Carolina. Um, and he was a member of the Colonial Assembly. He became uh, a president of the Committee of Safety, vice president of the whole state, and president of the Con Continental uh, Congress. And he's got an interesting life because uh, during the Revolutionary War, he was minister to the Netherlands and he was captured in 1780 by the British, locked up in the tower. The only person, the only American ever to have been locked in the Tower of London, uh, where later he was exchanged uh, for Lord Cornwallis, had been captured by the Americans. So he's an interesting character. And uh, obviously he had a certain amount of freedom being locked in the tower because that was where that painting was done. So he obviously was able to get a few luxurious items around him to be uh, painted. Uh, so Henry was an important, a very important contact. Champion formed um, a relationship with uh, Willing and Morris, a partnership in Philadelphia from whom he imported wheat and he did occasionally import sugar from them. And he cannot have chosen uh, a more influential uh, pair of people to do business with in Philadelphia. Let's just have a look. I'll start on the right. Thomas Willing was actually mayor of Philadelphia. Uh, he was a delegate to the Continental Congress. He was the first president of the Bank of North America and the first president of the Bank of the United States. And Robert Morris, who, who actually was uh, from Liverpool, 
Um, he became a member of the legislature, legislate, a, de a delegate to the Continental Congress, member of the Senate, and he was one of the founding fathers dubbed as the financier of the revolution because during the American uh, Revolution he managed to keep all the troops paid and so consequently he signed the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. So Champion cannot have had uh, two more influential people to do business with in America. Um, so let's just go back to see why and how he started the porcelain factory. So Cookworthy, who I already mentioned, um, first of all, he did some experiments in Bristol before he himself set up making porcelain. And they tried to fire some American clay from South Carolina, funnily enough. And they did this in Bristol, but the, the experiment just lasted for a few weeks. And uh, I think they couldn't get the porcelain to stay white, it, it got smoked or covered with bad colors and uh, they, they couldn't really do it. So after a few weeks, uh, that was given up, <clears throat> excuse me. And Cookworthy eventually started making porcelain in Plymouth. Uh, and he did that in 1768. And he patented his formula. Uh, and the formula was based on these Cornish materials from Thomas Pitt's uh, quarries, Thomas Pitt being the son of Lord Camelford, and was later, of course, to become Lord Camelford himself. And down at the bottom there, you see a white uh, figure of some putty with a goat, uh, and uh, it's on a very scrolling base, which is in the Rococo style. There's another one with a scrolling base. And uh, if, if you uh, are a student of porcelain, you will see the Roco Rococo style being extremely popular in the 1750s. In London, uh, it would have been popular in the 1750s and beginning to become a little bit out of date in the 1760s. But <clears throat> here we have Cookworthy, who started manufacturing porcelain in Plymouth in 1768. But to him, uh, the Rococo style is the right place the, the right way to go and uh, so most of what he made was was in the rococo style he also uh, made ordinary utilitarian wares like tea wares and he had some difficulty with the cobalt that was used to make the blue in the porcelain you can see it's almost black there but they're rather elegant wares and of course the great thing about the teapots is you could pour hot water into them and they wouldn't crack which unfortunately happened to quite a lot of english porcelain so that's uh, a little shell. It's a, a salt or a pickle dish. There's one actually just like that made, made by Champion subsequently. He went on making some of these things. And if you ever go to the Merchant Venturers in London, there's a little, uh, sorry, in Bristol, there's a, there's a little display um, uh, just uh, in one of the corridors of Bristol Porcelain, including something just like that. And this mug um, is painted by a French painter who Cookworthy recruited uh, from Sèvres, and uh, he was a, a very good painter of birds and uh, landscapes. And this lovely lion, which used to be in my collection, I rather like his whiskers. I think he's a very thoughtful chap with a, a crinkled brow. And uh, I, I used to love that. I, I had that for a number of years. So if you go to the V&A in London, you will see a massive amount of uh, Plymouth porcelain all in one cabinet lots of figures and uh, quite a few tea wares and things. And they were all made with this unique uh, hard paste porcelain, which was patented. But it was very difficult working in Plymouth and uh, it was difficult to get timber. He, he wanted to fire his kilns with timber and he just couldn't get it for the right price. And there were lots of other supplies that were so much easier to get in Bristol than they were in Plymouth. So in 1770, uh, having already made the connection with Champion and a few other Bristol Quakers who were prepared to fund a new factory in Bristol, uh, Cookworthy decided to relocate to Bristol. And this little drawing, which I believe may have been done by Richard Champion actually, was of the enamel kiln, the kiln that they used for the, the paint, painting, which was put on the surface. And... Uh, 
just uh, over there, indicated by an arrow, it says the last burning of the enamel kiln is November 1770. So that was the last thing that happened uh, in Plymouth. And in the new Bristol porcelain factory, Richard Champion was made the manager. So quite how he did this with all his merchanting activities, I don't know, but he did. And one can see that uh, when he takes over, um, he starts to influence things quite quickly. He actually bought Cookworthy out four years later in 1774. But as early as 1772, here he is writing to a, a modeler who is a person who made the molds for these uh, figures. And he's telling him he wants a winged zephyr crossed with flowers, treading on clouds, rise naturally about him, his robes flowing and flying behind him. He holds in one hand the branch of a tree. If any ornaments behind are wanting, one cherub, his head blowing, would not be amiss. And you can see down there, there's a little cherub with his head blowing. And although that still has a rather scrolled base, the flowing robes are really almost uh, like the sort of Grecian style. And we're, we're moving quite quickly towards a style which is more in the neoclassical taste, which was fashionable in London. So the younger man, Champion, sort of knew what he wanted and soon the figures that Bristol made were not recognisable by flowing and scrolling uh, bass or anything like that. This is, uh, I think, Wordsworth and Shakespeare, I believe it was supposed to be. Um, they are much more in the neoclassical vein. And here is one that is absolutely uh, neoclassical. Uh, based uh, on, well, actually a painting which is now lost um, by Angelica Kaufman, but that print of it uh, was published in 1771 and may have been the source of uh, the figure which uh, on the left, which, which is rather beautiful, particularly left in the white so that you see the porcelain looking at its best. And they also made, although it's not clear whether they made them commercially, these little plaques and they were modeled and you've got the fine petals uh, uh, being modelled in this hard paste porcelain. I think a lot of them were actually Champion's idea of uh, gifts that he could give to people that he wanted to get to know. And he was an ardent Whig and he, he was very active in Bristol politics. And so a lot of people, including uh, a lot of peers and a lot of MPs, uh, did actually receive gifts of plaques. This plaque, I don't know if it was a gift for anybody, but you can see that he's taken on board the neoclassical taste, uh, even on these plaques. Um, and this is following a discovery of this wall painting uh, in Pompeii. So Champion, although I don't think he actually knew a massive amount about how to fire the porcelain, certainly knew what style he wanted to impose on the factory. And the result was that it became increasingly more elegant. And here's, a, here's a, a jug with the initials of John Britton, who was a manager, a, a very important manager, because he did know how to fire porcelain. And uh, he was the key man, I think, at the Bristol Porcelain Factory. And uh, you can see now that we've got little <clears throat> swags of flowers in more of a neoclassical style. And you have these sort of Grecian uh, profile figures uh, on the sides. And those profile figures um, are usually attributed to somebody called Henry Bone, who many years later was termed the Prince of Enamelers because he went to London and started, after he, he worked for Champion, he, he started doing enamels and he's, he's done some wonderful enamels. They sell for very, very high prices. And it was he who did most of these little paintings of uh, heads in profile on the side of the porcelain. So during that period from 1772 onwards, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Champion made a lot of improvements to the factory. Um, he started emulating other factories and uh, this shape of junk, for example, is similar to one made by Sev, which is the one on the left and on the right a Bristol one printed with a neoclassical uh, pattern. And these uh, pieces uh, at the top, a wonderful uh, Bristol piece. Uh, I don't know if it's for Posset or 
It may even be a chocolate cup and saucer. Uh, they were double handled quite often. And down at the bottom, a serve one in a very similar style. So he was picking up on influences and he was trying to make things that were really of the highest quality. Um, and I think in some ways he had to because this process of making uh, Chinese style porcelain involved a very high firing temperature. So it was actually difficult and it was actually expensive. And so if you couldn't sell at high prices, uh, you obviously were not going to be very successful. Here's a terrine again, it's a terrine with a picture of a terrine, strangely enough, uh, in the centre, but uh, festooned with, with lovely gilding and, uh, again, somewhat neoclassical in taste. So these improvements did make some very nice things. And, and this is the piece, unfortunately, that I've packed in my bag because I'm taking it somewhere tomorrow, but it's the only one I've still got personally. And this little cup, which is from a service made for the Plumer family, and you can see... Uh, how much work went into not only applying gold, but then working it, tooling it. Uh, it it's a fantastic piece of work. And once again, you've got this uh, figure, uh, this profile uh, on the side. I'm rather amused by that one because I think it was Henry Bone having a bit of a joke because <laughs> it looks a little bit like a young version of Richard Champion. And I just wondered whether it was. But anyway, I shall never know. <clears throat> so Richard purchased the factory himself, bought out Cookworthy in 1774. He had to negotiate with Cookworthy, <clears throat> and Cookworthy was a canny uh, chap, and it was Cookworthy who had the lease on uh, Lord Camelford's land, where the clay and materials were coming from. And so Cookworthy, as part of the negotiation, agreed that he would retain that lease and he would supply materials to Champion, but marked up by 100% from what it cost Cookworthy. So he, he started with a bit of a disadvantage because his material costs were immediately uh, very high. But anyway, he did that. And just to talk briefly about his political act division, of course, because he was exporting to America, and many merchants in Bristol were doing the same thing. The approach of some sort of dislocation with America was a matter of enormous concern. So on behalf of the merchant venturers, he campaigned very, very actively. And it, he really was campaigning on their behalf and also really on behalf of the Americans uh, themselves, uh, who he believed had reasonable grievances uh, against the British government. And part of that was to get involved in the election in Bristol of Edmund Burke, the great statesman who was elected in 1774, uh, largely because of the help of Richard Champion. <clears throat> so Champion was very politically active and became extremely well connected in the Whig party to various uh, peers and others. Burke, uh, well, uh, here's a, a nice portrait of, of his, and, and he was active in Parliament for nearly 30 years and uh, was a great uh, advocate of rapprochement with America during the uh, independence period, uh, which are, was the sentiment that, that Champion himself uh, followed. So he became a great ally, uh, Edmund Burke, and uh, Edmund Burke was a great friend of Champion's, and uh, they knew each other very well and uh, got on very well. So you will see from, this is the number of export shipments that Richard Champion made in two particular years. And you'll see that uh, at the time that um, he took over the factory from Cookworthy, his business was thriving and growing really rapidly. But unfortunately, of course, uh, there was trouble ahead and I will come back to that. But Richard pressed on uh, with uh, his porcelain making. And incidentally, these two photos on the left, they're not there for any good reason, except that I wanted to explain that this hard paste porcelain, it is difficult to fire, and sometimes it sagged in the kilns. So instead of having a single foot rim underneath a dish, um, Champion started putting two, uh, much in the style that Meissen and others did, 
to try and make sure they didn't collapse in the kiln. Anyway, the patent. The patent that Cookworthy had and which was assigned uh, to Richard Champion still had seven years to run. And the sensible thing would have been to have made hay with it. But Champion was, well, I think he was a little bit greedy because he wa immediately wanted to extend the patent. And he had the Duke of Portland and he had various other leading Whig peers and he had a lot of people to support him because it had to go to an act of parliament in order to extend the patent. And so he went and presented his case for an extension, uh, even though the existing patent had seven years to run. And here is the here are the, the, the fatally damaged result, because what actually happened is that he hit major opposition. Uh, some of it was um, from Potters in Liverpool, but the main thrust was from Potters in Staffordshire, led by uh, Josiah Wedgwood. And Josiah Wedgwood, funnily enough, shared quite a few radical views uh, with Champion, but it was he who really kiboshed it. He organised all the Staffordshire Potters uh, in complaint against the extension of this patent. And I won't read it out, but that yellow section there, what he did was to achieve, uh, Wedgwood achieved an amendment to the patent, which basically made it useless. And that was that you had to use exactly the same recipe in exactly the same proportions and no additional materials. And if you did that, you were breaching the patent. But if you had a couple of percent different in the mix of materials or you had a small additional material, the patent wasn't breached. And that was enough of an amendment to actually make the patent next to useless. Champion did try to protect it because several months later, he put in a specification that said, well, uh, the China stone is going to be between 10% and 40%, and the China clay is going to be between 90% and 60%. So, so he basically tried to cover the entire mix of, that anyone would ever want to make by putting in a specification that was so wide. But I think everyone thought that this patent was, was no longer effective. Despite this, and I don't know whether it was to present a good picture to Thomas Pitt, the, the owner of the, the clay, uh, or not, but he wrote a very sort of optimistic letter after the patent case saying to Thomas Pitt that actually, oh, everything's fine, you know, we've got the patent. But Thomas Pitt re required very, re replied very quickly, said, I have great respect for the opinion of your lawyers, but I own my good sir, it exceeds my comprehension to conceive how such a restriction can prevent their using Lord Camelford's materials, provided they alter any one of the proportions or introduce any new materials into the mixture. Wedgwood says your specification is a lighthouse, teaching the trade precisely what they are to avoid, which will only serve to bring them safely into port. So poor old champion had spent a lot of money and a lot of time on this, and the patent was basically demolished, not in seven years time, from, but from the day that that amendment was granted in 1775. And this year, 1775, is the first year when we began to hear um, that all is not well with Champion. Before I do that, I think I may have missed a slide at the beginning, but I, I will just tell you that uh, there was a great uh, ceramicist called Hugh Owen, who in 1773 wrote a book called 200 Years of Ceramic Art in Bristol. And Owen knew the Rawlins family who were descended from Champion. And as a result, he had access to a private uh, archive of papers uh, and writings about the Champion family. And when he wrote uh, 200 Years of Ceramic Art, it became uh, almost a bit of a biography about Champion. And he was very close to the family. The family themselves didn't have anything that indicated any problems with Richard Champion's life or behaviour. Um, and quite frankly, even if they had, I think as a friend of the Champion family, Owen were, would never have published it. So the publications, before I started doing my own book about Champion, the publications uh, that had been done on Champion were basically Victorian 
and they were basically hero worshipping. So it is disturbing to find um, this first reference, which I found uh, some years ago when I was doing research in Philadelphia. And the Fisher family uh, lived in Philadelphia. They were Philadelphia Quakers. And Jebez was the young man who, even during the early stages of the disputes over the Revolutionary War, was going to go to England. And while he was there, traveling in England and meeting various Quakers who he was being introduced to, he was also asked if he would look for some merchants uh, in England that uh, the Fishers could do business with. And so his father sent him a letter of advice that he could take with him about the various things he wanted him to do. And this is what he said about Bristol. At Bristol, we much want a good correspondent. Richard Champion, we think, is by no means such a one as we would choose, unless upon inquiry thou should find a better one cannot be had there. If a steady friend of reputation and property can be had suitable, we'd very much rather be connected with such a person. So here we are, even in 1775, uh, and, and obviously on the cusp of the American Revolution, um, some people are beginning to ra regard Champion as slightly unsafe to do business with, which is was, uh, a, a very strange thing for me to find. And at that point, I hadn't really re started researching the book. And uh, it was very odd, I thought, at the time. But the first thing that we see Champion doing that is slightly out of the ordinary is in 1776. And in that year, he makes a shipment to Charleston in South Carolina via Amsterdam using a ship that was owned by one of his relatives. And this ship stopped in the Caribbean and sold some of the cargo. And the rest was uh, landed at Charleston, where the goods were sold on Champion's behalf. Now, in Charleston was uh, John Lloyd. And John Lloyd was Richard Champion's brother-in-law. And he too was an extremely, uh, oh, he used to become an extremely successful politician in South Carolina. He was a merchant and he was a person of some influence. And it was he who received these goods on Champion's behalf. And he invested the cash proceeds of selling them. And he noted in his journal that uh, this money invested in bonds from South Carolina belonged to Champion. Um, and uh, I will be telling the story of what happened to this money. But basically, uh, the important thing to note is that this money was in uh, Carolina and Champion, as I shall go on to tell you, eventually emigrated, but could never get hold of it. And his daughter, who, who did know something about it, died in 1803 without having done anything. John Lloyd died in 1807. He left his money to Richard Champion's son, and Richard Champion's son died in 1813. And nobody had actually done anything about getting this money uh, to the descendants of Richard Champion. And then a third party administrator took over uh, the son's estate, Benjamin Bynum, and he knew nothing about all this. So he passed them down to Richard Lloyd Champion's family, but not to all the other Champion children. So that money, which was actually stashed away by Richard Champion in the hope that he himself could get it, um, was for years and years locked up in America. And it wasn't until the 1830s that some of the Champion descendants, some of his children, actually sued Benjamin Bynum, and they actually had to sue other brothers and sisters who'd had a partial uh, <clears throat> bequest out of, the, out of the money. So it resulted in an enormous family row uh, in the 1830s, uh, this money, because Champion himself never managed to get hold of it. Now, I, I actually tracked down um, this wonderful archive of the Rawlings family, which had been used by Hugh Owen when he'd written a book about Champion in, um, in the 1870s. And um, it is actually from that that I got a lot of information because Champion's grandson, whose name was Richard Champion Rawlings, wrote a lot of information about Richard. And family folklore had it that this uh, shipment 
had ended up in America because one of Richard Champion's ships had actually been captured by the Americans during the Revolutionary War. And that was what was written in, in Richard Champion Rawlins journal. <clears throat> and it's also what uh, was uh, written and copied uh, in the story which was written by Hugh Owen of Richard Champion's life. So it seems to have been quite wrong. Um, I went through all the records of captured ships and uh, there was actually one ship that was temporarily captured but it never landed in America and it was back in Bristol the following year because it was captured back by an English vessel. So that cannot have been the one. Uh, of course it could have been a mistake um, but there's really no evidence that the ship was ever captured. No such thing was ever mentioned in the evidence given in court. And then I found a letter in an American library from Champion to his friend, Henry Lawrence. And he says, I was disappointed in the repayment of some money in Charleston, which I had dispersed there in England to be paid there. So it's very clear that Champion did actually send this money out. And I think because the financial writing was on the wall, his merchanting business was threatened by the American Revolution, that he actually stashed this money uh, for his own use, but sadly never got hold of it. And uh, in 1839, 48 years after Champion's death, uh, the litigation was settled and there was £5,000 available to Richard's descendants. And Richard Champion Rawlins, his grandson, uh, went out to America and collected £5,000, which, because the exchange rate was so bad, he actually didn't collect £5,000. He he bought some wool and uh, uh, shipped it back to England where he, where he sold it. Uh, but this settlement finally reached English shores 63 years after Champion had died. So it's the most extraordinary event. And we can see why things were starting to get bad. In 1775, Champion's business had started to plummet in terms of the numbers of shipments as a merchant that he was able to make. Not only that, in 1775, the British government had banned all shipments to America. And so, strangely, suddenly, with shipments being made illegal, in 1776, uh, Champion is noted as having made three shipments to Amsterdam. And I would bet on them all have gone to America, including the one I just mentioned. And you can see that after that, uh, basically by 1778, Champion's shipping business was basically dead. So he was in desperate trouble and he still had five children. And it was in 1778 that the end was nigh. And <clears throat> mysteriously in the beginning of 1778, when you would have thought he would have been trying to rescue himself or he'd have been tending to the porcelain factory, his sister wrote this. My brother and sister champion set out for London, leaving me in the care of the family. All the children at being vacation time were at home. In early April, she wrote, during this time of being left in the care of the family, I had much anxiety on several accounts, but I seemed enabled to go through all the fatigue of body and mind I had to encounter with activity and good spirits. One of the most uncomfortable feelings was the constant expectation given to me of my brother and sister's return, which subjected me to continual disappointments. On the 1st of April, the long expected event happened and to my great satisfaction, I once more welcomed them home. So it seemed that Champion disappeared from Bristol for two and a half months with his finances at a low ebb. So what on earth was he doing? Well, this is a more involved story and I'll try and be as brief as I can. I'm sure you've heard of Benjamin Franklin. Uh, you, you may not have heard of Silas Dean and Arthur Lee, but Benjamin Franklin, Silas Dean and Arthur Lee were members of a delegation sent by the Americans to Paris in 1778 because the French had indicated, uh, being our natural enemies at that point, uh, they'd indicated that they might be prepared to assist the Americans with the Revolutionary War. And so this party of three went to Paris to negotiate with the French with the intention of trying to uh, make a treaty with the French. 
and they took with them uh, Dr. Edward Bancroft. Uh, Bancroft was an American, but he had been working and living in London for some time. And he was a medical doctor, uh, but his main claim to fame in this context is that he was the first known recorded double agent, and he was an American double agent. Uh, he worked for the Americans, spying for the Americans, and at the same time, whilst in Paris, he was hiding little notes in a hole in a tree for the British Secret Service. So he was a double agent. Now, Silas Dean, uh, amongst uh, this group of people, became ensnared in the most awful uh, scandal. And the nature of the scandal was this. <clears throat> it seemed that Silas Dean, among other people, were actually betting. There were people in London called stock jobbers. What they really were, uh, you, you can see I've said on the right there that they were writing insurance policies and they were making investments. But basically they weren't a lot different to bookmakers because what they were doing is writing insurance policies on when America, what date America would sign a treaty uh, with, the, with the French. And, uh, and the investments that they were making were all investments that they thought would benefit if America did sign treaties with the French. So basically, what Bancroft and possibly Silas Dean were doing is they were passing back information to stock jobbers uh, in the English uh, city. And they, they, some of them, were getting profit shares back for the investments that were made on their behalf. And that's how Silas Dean got dragged in to a scandal which went on for years and which became very public in the press, both in England and in America. And in one of those press articles, somebody said that they thought the information in Paris had come from John Lloyd. Now, John Lloyd, as you recall, uh, was the South Carolina, South Carolina politician who was Champion's brother-in-law. Well, John Lloyd, as it happened, was in Paris, but John Lloyd had nothing at all to do with this. Uh, he was completely uninvolved. And at that point, Richard Champion uh, sprang to John Lloyd's defense publicly by talking to people who later themselves spoke to the press. And Champion had admitted that he was one of the stock jobbers working in the city of London in that first three months of the year 1778. And he said he'd had no communication from John Lloyd at all. So it turns out that it is quite possible that Champion was getting his information from this American spy, Dr. Bancroft. And it's not all that surprising that he knew people like American spies because he was definitely a sympathizer with the American cause. And you might think, well, I'm judging people by modern standards of ethics, although this may be a, the, wrong, the wrong week to mention that. But in actual fact, the press, even in 1778, thought that what was going on in the city was disgraceful. And they referred in one instance to those common sharpers and robbers, the stock jobbing banditti. And so there we have Richard Champion, who I've inserted in there, uh, who it appears was gambling to try and get the money back to keep in business. So it was a, a great shock and very interesting to find this, particularly as it got so much press uh, and uh, it was a live event. And Richard ultimately came back. Uh, it was not clear whether he'd made any money out of these endeavors. And in August, 1778, he handed his assets to administrators. This, this was a way to avoid bankruptcy. And in some ways, it, it was a much softer way because most of the administrators were Quaker acquaintances of his. And they allowed him to keep his house. Uh, and what they said was that uh, he had to work for them and try and realize some of the assets of the China factory and any other assets uh, that he had. Um, this is this document. Uh, there's two copies. The one, the one there is one that I photographed in South Carolina, uh, in the archive in Camden, South Carolina, which is somewhere that Champion goes to. Um, but there's another in the Bristol uh, archive as well. And 
there are some papers in the courthouse which say how much Richard Champion went bust for. And uh, well, £635, it wasn't that, but uh, it would have been a good living for a middling sort in, in 1778. Um, it wasn't that, even though that was quite a lot of money in 1778. Richard Champion actually went bust with creditors of £63,500, which is several millions uh, by today's standards. Writing to the Duke of Portland about his misfortune, uh, before it's actually finalised, um, this is in July, so it's a month before he hands his assets over, he's obviously been discussing it and he says, by this settlement, I'll be entirely released and though I shall devote by agreement my time to the settlement of my affairs, which my interest <clears throat> as well as my duty engages me to, yet I've not much doubt of settling about the China manufactory, which is to be continued, and which have been already mentioned to me in that light, if I can raise friends. So here we have Champion thinking of buying the factory back, despite having just handed it over to administrators. In December of that year, he starts to bounce back. This is a very long letter, I won't read it all out, but he's basically saying to the Duke of Portland, I've agreed a deal. It involves four payments of a thousand pounds each, all at different dates. I've got enough money, and this is surprising and amazing, really. Uh, he'd obviously been left with some cash as well, because he says, I can meet the first two <clears throat> uh, payments, myself or with my own surety, but I do need to find some sort of security or some guarantee for the last two payments. And he says he thinks the sale of finished wares from the factory might raise the whole sum of £4,000. Um, and so he's looking for the Duke of Portland to uh, help him by guaranteeing the purchase of the factory. And there's evidence that the Duke of Portland indeed did guarantee him. And just when the third of those four payments was due, uh, Christie's had an auction sale uh, of all the stock. Well, I, I, I need to qualify that. I say all the stock, but this auction I've been through and added up all the prices and it only raised 800 pounds. Now, every lot sold. So I assume that Richard had for a couple of years between 1778 and 1780, maybe sold a lot of the stock, stock off himself, but the last lot was all put into auction and it made 800 pounds. And that was just at the moment when the third payment was due, which just left one further one to be made. It's rather funny because when the auction was advertised, Christie's advertised it as the stock of the Bristol China manufactory. Well, you can, ima you can imagine if Champion had just bought the factory, and incidentally, till I did my book, nobody, uh, I, I didn't discover this, a, a colleague, a ceramic friend of mine discovered it just as I was doing the book. So we published it simultaneously and nobody knew before that he'd bought the factory back. But of course, having bought it back, he'd be very worried that if there was an auction sale, the creditors might say, oh, that's all our, all our money. So the first, um, the first auction advertisement from Christie's said it was the stock of the Bristol China manufactory. The second auction uh, advertisement said, in the former advertisement, there was a mistake in mentioning this to be the stock of the Bristol China man manufactory it being only a collection of very valuable pieces manufactured at that place. So this was, this was Champion, I think, correcting the record. <clears throat> and the postscript on that is that uh, in 1816, uh, Champion's son wrote to the Duke of Portland, telling them that Champion hadn't made all the payments to the administrators to buy the factory back, and indeed, it may be that the late Duke, by now he, it was the Duke of Portland's son, who was the new Duke, who he was writing to, um, might have to pay up. The estate might have to pay up because Champion hadn't made all the payments. And so this was, this was uh, a difficult period. He bought the factory back, but there's no evidence that he ever made any more porcelain. He may have had some porcelain that wasn't decorated and had some painters paint it but he didn't fire any more clay, I don't think. And in 1781, he set off to Staffordshire 
to try and sell the patent, even though the patent, in my view, was useless. And he did form some sort of agreement with seven potters in Staffordshire. And it was a very important agreement in the history of ceramics. But the nevertheless, uh, for Richard himself, who was trying to set up a factory there, it didn't go well. And I don't think he, he got much money from selling the patent because the patent wasn't very valuable. And so I think by 1781, he was again short of money and beginning to wonder what was going to happen. But in 1782, he was rescued. And he was rescued by Edmund Burke, who became paymaster to the forces in the new uh, Whig government. And Champion was appointed as deputy paymaster, which involved him returning to London, which he, he did with un, undue haste. Uh, and he had quarters in the Chelsea barracks and he was deputy paymaster of the forces. This was a sinecure that may have actually offered many opportunities for making money, but uh, I don't have any information about that. However, it didn't go terribly smoothly because he took up his post in April. In July, the government fell. Uh, but uh, in the following April, uh, I have no idea what Champion was doing in that gap, um, a new Whig government was formed and Burke was reappointed and Champion was reappointed to their posts. Um, they rejoined with a certain amount of controversy uh, because there'd been two um, accountants from the office of the paymaster who'd been indicted for fraud. And there were two officers, Bembridge and Powell, uh, were both charged uh, with some sort of fraud. And there was an investigation into it that various people, including Champion, were called before the House of Commons. And both Champion and Edmund Burke himself gave good, good character references for one of the two, uh, Bembridge. And that was something which I'm sure they were to regret because Powell, the other uh, paymaster, he committed suicide and Bembridge was left alone to face trial where he was convicted. And it was the trial that actually set the president about laws relating to misconduct in public office. And unfortunately, it then emerged that Champion had actually borrowed money from Bembridge, which was not a good look at all. And Edmund Burke was absolutely furious. On the 3rd of October, 1784, he wrote to Champion, it should appear that you've borrowed money from him. If you have, I'm exceedingly concerned for it. You know that my enemies of all descriptions fastened upon my restoration of that unfortunate man as a point on which they thought me most vulnerable. They were conscious that they could not touch me for my conduct in office, which was to me an object of reform, not of abuse. But they persecuted me with no small success for not being active in the punishment of those whom the ill constitution of office had betrayed in irregularities. Indeed, it was absolutely necessary that it should not have been any pecuniary transaction with him whatsoever. Let it be as innocent as it would. You were so situated that you had my reputation in some measure in your keeping as well as your own. I know the allowance that is to be made for the distress, and I do allow for it. Adieu, my friend, I wish you all happiness in the new world, that the old, which punishes indiscretions as vices and misfortunes as crimes, would not let you enjoy here. And with that, a week later, Champion left England forever and left for South Carolina. On the way out, he started to write a paper, a pamphlet, and he was to write more political pamphlets uh, from America. In it, he took up the issue of whether he was an American agent. He said, by some, I've been called an American agent. By one writer, I'm styled the apologist of Congress. If being an advocate for the rights of mankind, an advocate for peace, for the return of good offices, which formerly distinguished Great Britain and her colonies, an advocate for the re-establishment of those measures, which has raised the glory of an England to a height unknown since that of the Romans was, were extinguished, is being a professed apologist for Congress, then I acknowledge I am one and I glory in the title. 
So poor old Champion was very, very disillusioned uh, when he left uh, and went to America. And he went first and stayed a short while in uh, Charleston on the coast of South Carolina. But then he moved 100 miles inland, uh, a long way from a lot of things. He moved to Camden, South Carolina, which was a trading post. So quite a lot of people traveled through it. Um, and there, <clears throat> presumably with the help of John Lloyd, because he had no money of his own, he bought a plantation or a plantation was made available to him. It was, to say the least, <clears throat> very remote. It still is today. That's the Google map version. And, uh, when I went into this site, which, which was slightly private, so I was a little nervous, uh, I don't know. There was a, a standing chimney from a, a sort of house just there. I don't know whether that's where he lived. As you can see, it goes right down to the river. Very beautiful and a very remote place now. So certainly extremely remote, about 11 miles from Camden uh, in sort of forested area. And that's where he set up home. And even in the early 2000s, uh, it was remembered as his home uh, in America. And when, when the property was sold uh, in 2001, it had a sign saying it was Richard Champion's estate. His first impressions were good. He, he wrote to Henry Lawrence. It's, he likes it very much. It's a thriving place, good management and different conduct of that from the stores in general. Much money might be got the trade of the county about it, and even, even far back of it made to centre here. So he's saying, you know, it could be a centre for all of the backlands of South Carolina. He says the people are hospitable, much more so than Charleston, it appeared to me. So he's happy there. He's moved in. He actually handed the entire running of uh, these, um, the, the, these estates to his son, Richard Lloyd Champion, and John Lloyd Champion, uh, he's got all five children out there with him, some of whom are still quite young. And not long later, two years later in 1787, uh, he becomes an American citizen. And presiding over the Senate when he becomes an American citizen, his brother-in-law, John Lloyd, who's helped him in every way uh, whilst he's been in America. And then a little later than that, in the same year, you can see uh, his name uh, at, at the bottom of this, and he's become a clerk to the court. In fact, I think he became uh, a judge. Uh, he became a judge. And then a little later still, he's actually a representative for his area in a convention held in the capital to draw up a new constitution for the state of Carolina. So by 1990, he's, he's well, he's found himself. He, he's actually, uh, I don't know if he's unique, but it, it's very rare for anyone to have been in public service, uh, both sides of the Atlantic during the Revolutionary War within a, you know, a four or five years of each other. It is an extraordinary thing to have done. And it does seem that he's given up business for good. Uh, and these are the things that are making him happy. Sadly, though, in the same year, uh, Judith died, and I think this was a very great blow for Richard. Many people who went to the southern states uh, died from various fevers and strange things. It, it wasn't... Uh, the immunity didn't get round the world the way uh, uh, it does now, and so you go to a strange place and you pick up illnesses you've never ever seen before. And I don't know if that's what happened, but the following year we find that Richard Champion himself has died. Uh, so he was only actually in America for seven years, but he achieved uh, quite a lot uh, as a member of the American community. And he lived a happy life. Uh, his grandson uh, writing in that journal um, says, I remember my mother's description of the happy life the family lived at Rocky Branch. Almost every article of consumption having been provided upon the farm, even making of soap, weaving of cloth, and many of, for many of their garments. 
And so Champion, although he was interred somewhere else, was moved back to the Quaker Cemetery. When he, when he went bust, he did finally get separated from the Quakers, but after his death in America, he was reinterred in a Quaker ceremony, uh, cemetery. And that's where he is today in a very sunny sort of pine grove uh, and uh, surrounded by uh, members of his family. And this is another thing that was written um, by Richard Champion. In less than two years, the farm eight miles from Camden was purchased. I don't know if there was a house there already, or whether it was built by my grandfather, but I remember my mother's description of it as a long, low timber built erection, all on one floor, and that the library occupied the entire width of one end of it and was filled by an extensive collection of books bought from England and added to from time to time, leaving the active management of the cotton plantation to his sons. My grandfather devoted himself to literary pursuits. And it was, in fact, the literary pursuits, uh, which was the last mention of Richard Champion uh, in the press uh, in Camden. And that was the former library of Richard Champion being sold and catalogues to be had uh, in the centre of Camden. And this was Champion's book plate. Uh, which uh, he had done in printed in Bristol before he left. And he was obviously a great reader. Uh, of course, Quakers couldn't go to university. They weren't allowed to go to un university and they were largely self-taught. Self so when one looks at uh, Champion, uh, and I'll just flick through uh, as I finish, I'll just flick through a few more pieces of his porcelain. Um, as, one, as one thinks about Champion, he was self-taught, he was from a renowned family, but his father wasn't a renowned member of that family. He struggled from a young age to actually make a living, and he succeeded to a great extent. He succeeded in making some of the finest uh, porcelain uh, in the 1770s. There's no question of that. And in the 1870s, when Hugh Owen, this other author, wrote a book about Champion, uh, Bristol porcelain was being sold weight for weight more than gold was being sold for. It was really extraordinarily expensive. It still is quite expensive today. Uh, and, and Champion was a strange man. He was obviously a dynamic man. He, he was a political man. He coveted political office, and I think he would have hoped to be honored. But of course, his financial difficulties ruined all of that. And I think immediately that his financial difficulties got ruined. Um, this meant that uh, he lost his moral compass to a certain extent and he struggled to save his family from financial ruin and in the process he did a number of things which uh, probably uh, ought to be frowned upon somewhat uh, but he's a very dynamic person and a very interesting person to have studied uh, all because i started doing a book on porcelain and finished up doing a book on richard champion so i will end with a small plug for that if anyone's interested in uh, seeing more pictures of the porcelain he made and also this story in a little bit more detail, um, it is still for sale, uh, my little book. And uh, nothing else to do except thank you very much indeed for listening for so long. So thank you. Nick, <coughs> sorry, Nick, that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you very much. Um, things of which I knew absolutely nothing. Um, I suspect, I don't know how many of our audience already knew anything about him or, or, or pottery or so on. Um, if anybody's got any questions for Nick, um, please unmute yourselves and, um, and let's have some questions. Absolutely amazing. It's probably just worth mentioning that if anyone does uh, take an interest in seeing what the porcelain is like, that there is a fantastic uh, collection of it in the uh, Bristol Museum. Oh, right. Indeed, indeed uh, I, I, to my great embarrassment, I turned up there having <clears throat> made an appointment with the then curator to take some photographs of some of it. And I, I was early, so I went into the galleries and there were all these gaps and there were little notes saying removed for photography. So I did ruin that display on at least one day in my past. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot, of, a lot of things from the museum are in the book, actually. Nicholas, um, 
a fascinating talk, very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. One thing you didn't, I don't think you mentioned was where the pottery in Bristol actually was. Well, it was at Castle Green. I think it's now under a park. Oh. Uh, um, it was at Castle Green and after, uh, after it failed, um, a few years later, it was in the hands of another member of the Champion family who was making clay pipes there. And then I think later still, some even more evil industrial process took place. So much as I'd love to encourage Bristol archeology span to go digging in the park, I don't know what you would find, but it's never been excavated. And it's a great shame as it's in a park, mm -hmm. but, it, but it isn't. Thank you. Any more? Do you know where he found the um, the people to do the artwork? I mean, it's it's an incredibly high standard. Well, um, yes, I I do actually. Uh, I'll cut it very short. But basically, okay. there was a factory in London at Vauxhall, which had some <clears throat> very good painters and some good modellers, and. That man too went bust and the factory failed in 1764. And by 1766, uh, that man whose name was Nicholas Crisp turned up again in Bobby Tracy where he started making China and he'd taken a lot of the Vauxhall workmen uh, with him. And Cookworthy was very surprised by this. He found someone making porcelain just a few miles from where, where he was. So he actually, uh, got interested in this making of porcelain at Bobby Tracy, which was to only last about 18 months. It failed within 18 months. But it, it coincided with the time when Cookworthy was actually setting up shop. So Cookworthy recruited and took all the workmen from Bobby Tracy to Plymouth. And then some of those Plymouth workmen went to Bristol. So they'd been all the way round the pottery industry, starting in London, and some of them had actually started in Staffordshire. So <laughs> they'd been all around the industry and finished up at Bristol. Fascinating. Yeah. And, and I actually, um, there, there, there was a, a porcelain factory in Philadelphia, which started in 1770. And I was actually fairly convinced uh, because they copied a shape used only at Plymouth. I was fairly convinced that one or two of the workmen even finished up in Philadelphia, but I could never prove it. Yeah, interesting. As ever, it always seems fascinating to me how much people packed into quite short lives, because I think, did you say he died at 48? Yes. And, um, yes. I mean, he, he I mean, was, a huge amount of research you've done and found out what he'd done in that time. I mean, he was amazing. He, he was only um, 21 when he started the factory in Bristol. Mm. Yeah. And he, 19 when he started being a merchant and then he was a merchant and a potter at the same time and and actively political in bristol as extraordinary extraordinary really yeah he's a dynamic person who in a, in a different world or in a different life without the american revolution in the middle i think he would have been a very successful man actually mm. Mm. yeah good fantastic great Anybody well, else? Thank, thank you for listening anyway. It's no, 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 it's really interesting. As I said at the beginning, it was something I, I knew nothing at all about. And then you obviously ranged far and wide beyond just the pottery bit, which was also fascinating. Well, that's right. You see, I, I started off wanting to write a very big book about Plymouth and Bristol porcelain. And I actually brought three or four co-writers on board with me who had particular expertise. And some of them wrote their stuff and some of them didn't. And then the book was getting very, very, very big. And I was thinking, how am I going to write captions for a thousand photographs? It's... <laughs> <laughs> and, and during it all, I, I, a researcher, an, an Irish researcher actually, found this press article which implicated Champion in this dealing in, in the city. And uh, it was so interesting that when I finally decided that I would leave someone else to write a book on Bristol porcelain, uh, a big book on Bristol porcelain and on Plymouth, I decided to abandon that. But I thought, well, 
what I ought to do is to try and this is a story that never been told. And uh, it was so contrasting with the book that had been written about Champion before, which was that he was totally wonderful, marvellous, innocent, mm. innocent saint of a person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and trust me i had to spoil it but there you are <laughs> so human nature hasn't changed in uh, <laughs> 250 years or whatever <laughs> <laughs> splendid well thanks ever so much nick it's really really fascinating any, any, any final questions yeah. from anybody well you're very welcome anyway thanks no brilliant yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Shall I just put in a plug for our next session? Oh, I was just going to say to you, Jackie, yes. When you, yeah. you... We, we don't have anything in December, as you probably know, but in January, we have got a um, Robert Jones, Bob Jones, who had a, a leading uh, part in the 1472 map, which was produced of Bristol. And Jane Venner-Pack has kindly bought the Society two copies. Um, and he's going to talk about how that happened, how it was made. But we're hoping also, if we can, and get into the lodge in January, we can have a, <clears throat> an open session for people to come and actually see the maps in person. But we'll have to see how things pan out over Christmas. But, yes, um, I think maps over Zoom is not, not the easiest way to view them. <laughs> no, I mean, he's got a presentation which he's done already, um, so I'm sure he'll show the maps, but it would be nice for people to come and see the real thing. Absolutely. So we'll try and sort the two out. Good, but thank you, Nick, very much. It was lovely fascinating okay. evening thanks a lot cheers thank thanks you. everyone bye bye then bye bye thank you very much thank you thanks, yeah. thanks. it was good